This series is about all the stuff we just can't live without. Whether it's products for personal hygiene, home cleaning, or even DIY. It's about those bottles, cans, sprays, jars, and tubes crammed into our cupboards, drawers, handbags, sheds, and cars. I want to know what's in all this stuff. I'm Jane Moore and I've been handed the ultimate dream ticket. The chance to pull apart some of the most essential items on my everyday shopping list and zero in on precisely what's in them that makes them work. We're just in a flash cycle now. <laughs> it's a mission that's set to take me right out of my comfort zone. Oh God, I can't bear it. And one which demands I get intimate with an army of boffins and some mind-blowing science. Well, that worked. <laughs> I might have bunked off chemistry at school, but I know I can trust my nose when it comes to sniffing out the facts. So I'm actually going to wreck. <laughs> yes, I'm hunting for the wonder stuff that holds our lives together. Time I fling open the bathroom cabinet to find the wonder stuffs we all rely on to stay preened and cleaned. There are four things in what the supermarkets call the personal care aisle that I buy more than anything else. That's soap, shampoo, conditioner and toothpaste. My challenge is to go behind the labels and discover the magic ingredients that keep us clean. Later on in the programme, I'll be out to get my hands on the wonder stuffs at the heart of hair conditioner. Visually, as peaks go, it's like a molehill up against Mount Everest. Absolutely. And toothpaste. They have much of a foaming action. Have no foaming action. <laughs> it has gravel action, <laughs> is what it has. But before all that, I want to get the lowdown on what has to be the ultimate bathroom essential: soap. As a nation, we use over a hundred thousand metric tons of soap every year. And the story of what makes it so good at getting us clean will take me back 5,000 years. My new best friend, material scientist Dr. Mark Miodovnik, reckons he can show me what makes soap so hard to beat when it comes to personal hygiene. Oh, by creating some, much as our ancestors knew it. We're going to have a go at cooking up some soap made to the original recipe. Hi, Mark. Oh, just a hot dog for me, thanks. Uh, well, uh, we're going to eat later. I thought we, I thought first we could try and make soap the old-fashioned way. Oh. The way it's been made for thousands and thousands of years before the modern era. Mark is going to conjure up soap from two ingredients that would have been a basic part of life for our ancestors. So we're going to take fat, which is just normal fat, mm -hmm. uh, lard, and we're going to add an alkali to it, which we're going to make from wood ash, right? So. This is something that our ancestors really valued. Um, it was very important for their crops, but also it turns out how to make soap. So how do you think they discovered this? It's definitely been around for about 5,000 years. It was probably because people were roasting meat over the fire and it was dripping down this fat from the meat and mixing with the ashes and making soap. And people must have picked it out of the fire the next day and thought... They said, I'll do this. And in fact, the word alkali is the Arabic for from ashes. So let's see if Mark can recreate this most fundamental of chemistry miracles. The ashes Mark has collected from the fire are added to water to create something called caustic potash, a strong alkali at the other end of the pH scale to an acid, he tells me. What we're doing is, is we're getting the liquid, the water, to dissolve out uh, the active ingredient in here and, and it'll become, it'll dissolve into the water and in a minute we'll, we'll see it clearing and there'll be this this brownish, muckish water, which is exactly perfect. So there we are, nicely plunged. Yes. Uh, I'm going to show you something from your past, which is probably going to make you slightly fearful, given your... It's not your one of my ex-boyfriends, <laughs> is it? It's worse! <laughs> it's litmus paper um, uh, from your chemistry lessons of old. Oh, do, do you remember this thing yes. about how do you tell if something's acidic acid, alkali, or alkali? Yes. And it goes blue if it's an alkali, and it goes red if it's an acid. So if this is an alkali, this, should, this piece of paper should go blue. Oh, that's properly blue. Yeah, and that is victory for us Ooh. and for our ancestors because that means that if we take that liquid and we add it to some fat, we are going to get soap. Our potash solution is very dilute, so we need to boil it on the hob to make the alkali more concentrated. 
step is to melt down the fat. It's nothing more complicated than good old lard. Well, I feel like Delia Smith. Our potash soup is now a nice dark brown gunk, ready to go into the melted fat. Personally, I'll be amazed if we can make soap from this. Enter the alkali. This is what's known in the trade as saponification, literally soap making. Something's definitely happening. It's like a sort of an atomic cloud. We, we've made a reaction between the fat and the, and the alkali. Can you see what's happening? Yeah. That is soap. Ah. Yes, it's and can of... you see the suds? Yeah. This raw soap is caustic enough to strip paint. We should now leave it for about a day to become solid and safe to handle, but we're in a hurry to see if it works. We're going to have a go at some of these everyday muck stains that we all know about. Chocolate spread being one of them, lipstick and shoe polish. So here we go. I'll use the homemade soap. Mark will just use water. The gloves are just in case there's a bit of leftover alkali which could burn our skin. If we've managed to make proper soap, it should be able to break down stains, disperse them in water and leave the glove clean. Well, the lipstick is coming off far more easily than yours appears to be doing. I'm just spreading the lipstick all over me. That's all that's happening. Yeah, yeah. no, mine's, mine's oh, sort wow. of... Yeah. yeah, yeah, you've done very well there. Right, let's compare. <laughs> oh, victory is mine. Look, that, is, that has come off pretty much completely, and that is a disaster area. Our ancient soap recipe works a treat. Made simply from fat and alkali, the chemical reaction between the two produces a new substance that will clean away dirt. And remarkably, there's little difference between our homemade effort and the more refined soaps we pick off the shelves. Over 10 million UK homes still use bars of soap, and most of it starts life as this stuff, soap noodles. Their basic recipe of fat plus alkali is the same, except animal fat is now usually swapped for vegetable fats like palm oil. Add colour and perfume and you have modern soap. Having stripped soap back to its basic components, I definitely feel as though I've discovered the original cleaning wonder stuff. The recipe might be thousands of years old, but you could argue that this magical substance is still the bedrock of modern hygiene. But like a lot of people, I don't buy as many bars of soap as I used to, opting for liquid hand wash and shower gel instead. And I suddenly spot a recurring theme on the labels. Sodium laureth sulphate. Sodium laureth sulphate. Sodium laureth sulphate. Seems like it's not soap itself I've been using, but something called, you've guessed it, sodium laureth sulphate. Check this out. It's also in these shampoos, both basic and posh. So it looks like I've been putting it on my hair all these years as well. But what on earth is this stuff and where does it come from? And is it doing something that good old soap can't? Time to look inside one of the most crucial bottles of all when it comes to our daily ablutions, shampoo. To find out, I've been invited onto the shop floor of a factory that makes shampoo for supermarket-owned brands. That must be why McBride's in Bradford seems to virtually run on sodium laureth sulphate, or SLES, as it's often called. Sodium laureth sulphate is the primary detergent that we produce here. So it goes across shower gels, shampoos, foam baths, they all use sodium laureth sulphate, really. In terms of a week, we use about 100 tonnes. 100 tonnes? Yes. Michael Anderton, a product developer here, reckons I need the lowdown of what goes into a typical shampoo if I'm going to understand the significance this single chemical plays in the formulation. So here we've got the batch that Chris is halfway through making. Woo. There's a preservative to stop the shampoo going mouldy in the bottle. Fragrance and colouring for impressionable folks like me. There's a water softener and something to adjust the pH to a skin-friendly neutral state. But it turns out that up to 50% of shampoo is, yes, you've guessed it, sodium laureth sulphate. 
this is a 10 ton vessel and it'll produce anything between 10 and 20,000 bottles. 20,000 bottles of yes. shampoo, that would sort me out for a lifetime, <laughs> wouldn't it? Absolutely. So there it is. I've clearly been relying on sodium laureth sulphate and its close chemical cousin sodium laurel sulphate to keep my hair clean. But how does it actually work? To answer that, I'm going to need a scientist. So next up, Warwick University, where chemist Julianne Loch wants to show me why this cleaning agent is so good. She's making some sodium laurel sulphate from scratch, but instead of adding alkali like Mark and I did when we made soap, she's mixing some fat with acid, sulfuric acid to be exact. Amazingly though, the result is mild enough to use on our skin. If you leave this overnight to cool down, you do get something that looks exactly like ah. this. This is our sodium laurel sulphate. It feels exactly like a kind of a, a liquid hand wash or yeah. um, a shampoo or a conditioner. It has that, that feel of something yeah. runny and cleaning, yeah. By changing soap's chemical recipe, you get a totally new kind of detergent. And here's the killer reveal. This synthetic detergent beats my homemade soap hands down in one crucial way. Oh, yes, I can see there's a very distinct uh, line of scum there. With hard water, which is present in lots of parts of the United Kingdom, you have calcium and magnesium ions, and when they react with the molecules that are in your soap, they form little scums that don't dissolve in the water. So when traditional soap mixes with hard water, it creates a nasty scum that'll lie on the skin or mark sinks, baths and clothing. But sodium laurel sulphate, on the other hand, you're not getting that scummy layer that no. we found before. It's just much clearer. With lots of lovely bubbles, just right for my shampoo. Because of their resistance to scumming, the SLES family of substances is much more versatile as a cleaner than our humble bar of soap. And they've got one more trick up their sleeve. Just add salt solution, and this stuff magically thickens up into a handy gel used in toothpaste, shaving foam, and laundry liquids. Brilliant. Now, if the adverts are to be believed, then shampoo is only half of the hair care story. And for that extra radiance and silky shine, we should all be taking another little bottle into the shower with us. Conditioner. But is there actually any proof that conditioner works. Back to the experts for some answers. The gloriously titled analytical hairdresser, Beverly, is going to put conditioner to the test for us. Hair model Sharon has her locks washed all over with a basic shampoo, like the one we saw mixed earlier. Then only one side is treated with a precision four milliliter dose of an average conditioner. But essentially with the shampoo you're looking to cleanse the hair, so you're looking to take the dirt and soil away from the hair. With the conditioner you're trying to put something back on. The objective is to treat the hair with something that will make it look and feel nicer and make it easier and less painful to drag a comb through. So first up, how's the hair with no conditioner? So here we go Sharon, I'm going to have a quick go at combing your hair. Don't scream out like my six-year-old. Now already look, I'm hitting hitting quite a bit of knotting here. Yeah, that's what I recognise, that big lump of tangle. Michael explains the tangle has a rather shocking cause, electricity. When you wash the hair, you leave a negative charge on there. You get a repulsion between each hair strand. Um, so obviously the more negative charge you've got there, the more repulsion you're going to get. Hair, or rather the keratin it's made of, naturally gains a static electric charge which makes the hair frizzy and reluctant to lie flat. That makes it prone to tangles. So what about the condition side? Has that dealt with the electric frizz? See, straight away I can notice a big difference. It's much, much smoother and yes. silkier. All the words that I associate with good conditioner. Yes. So it looks like the conditioner's having some kind of electrical effect on the hair, making it much less tangled. So this has now been positively charged in a way. Yes, I mean, neutralised is probably what you'd say because the positive charge is counteracting the effect of the negative charge. And the positive charge is coming from? Something called a quaternary ammonium compound. 
Um, you what? <laughs> well, they're commonly known as quats. Oh, that's better. Yes. I can understand that. So that's how conditioner works. These anti-static quats are our wonder stuff, doing something pretty amazing, giving out a positive electrical charge, which counteracts the natural negative charge on hair. And here at McBride, they've even got a crazy combing contraption, which can tell them exactly how much difference the quats are making. This Frankenstein-esque gizmo combs samples of real hair, happily given by hair donors, I'm assured, from root to tip and measures the force needed to do it. This is the, um, the force of the comb moving through the hair here, and then along the bottom is the length of the tress. The black line is for a tress of hair washed with the simple shampoo. The red line is for a more expensive shampoo with a few extra proteins and vitamins thrown in. Both are without quats. Actually, there's very little resistance as it moves through, but as you get towards the end of the tress, that's where the tangling starts to appear. So you think of split ends and things like that. That's kind of where you get into here. So the hair washed with the more expensive shampoo wasn't dramatically easier to comb compared with the basic shampoo. But what happens when you treat the hair with quats, shown by a green line? Wow, that's a marked difference, isn't it? Absolutely. The much bigger effect that you get is from the conditioner. There's about an 85% reduction in the force that's required to comb through the hair. Visually, it... as peaks go, it's like a molehill up against Mount Everest. Absolutely, yes. Clearly, the quats are having a noticeable detangling effect. They work on the individual hairs, allowing them to lie flatter, making the whole head of hair look smoother. Quats are clearly pretty clever stuff. And if I'm starting to sound a bit like an advert, it's because for once it seems I'm not being fobbed off by marketing claims. There really is a science bit involved in conditioners. So from now on, rather than fork out 20 quid on a fancy celebrity-endorsed shampoo, I might just opt for a more basic one and then buy a separate conditioner as long as it has a healthy dose of quats in it. Oh, and by the way, you probably won't see the word quats on labels as it's a generic that encompasses many different chemicals. But you might see cationic surfactant. So that's my hair taken care of. You're a pink toothbrush, I'm a But what about my precious teeth? We met Time to look inside the tube before. that keeps my pearly whites white. Hmm, not bad. When I'm buying a toothpaste, I tend to go for one that promises to make my teeth whiter. But now I want to decode the label. What's in there that's making it work? And is there a magic ingredient without which all of our smiles would be various shades of tea stain brown? According to my materials expert, Mark, the best way to find out if a formula for toothpaste is user-friendly is to make some and test it on yourself. It looks like he's got another of his homebrew experiments lined up, but I've no idea why he summoned me to the beach. Still, at least it's sunny. A bit of fresh air, fresh cold sea. Hi, Mark, how are you? Hi, Jane, how are you doing? <laughs> nice, yeah, nice to see, see you, you again. Yeah. yeah. I see the shock of working with me last time has made your beard drop off. I'm on holiday on the beach. It's <laughs> too hot for a beard. Now, come on, why are we on the beach, then? It turns out that the beach is the perfect place to talk about toothpaste and making toothpaste. The beach is the perfect yeah, place for ice cream and sunbathing. <laughs> toothpaste I'm not so sure about. Mark reckons teeth are unlike any other material found in our bodies and need a special kind of cleaning stuff. But the enamel on your teeth is the hardest material in the body. And it has to be, right? It has to be because you've got to grind all these things up and it's going to last you a lifetime. Well, obviously, we use these toothpaste to look after the enamel on our teeth, yeah. but, I mean, other than knowing it's some kind of paste, uh, it's in the <laughs> title, and it's minty most of the time, yeah. I don't really know what else is in there, so... Yeah. Well, let's have a look. To demonstrate what's so special about toothpaste, we're going to make some from scratch. Right. Right. You don't see this on Ready, Steady, Cook. We're going to make toothpaste. First up, water. Aqua. Then stuff to make it taste nice. Sodium saccharine, that's the sweetener. There we that. are. Peppermint flavour. Ah, yes. And stop it going off. Oh, sodium benzoate, that's a preservative. A cleaning and foaming agent we're already familiar with. Sodium laurel sulphate is now going in. I'm making an, a, a mixture here for something that I put in my mouth, and yet I've just tipped in a sort of a sister of what goes into shampoo. 
This is weird. And a tooth strengthener. This is sodium fluoride. It hardens the enamel up. Wow. God, that's clever stuff, isn't yes. that? There's a lot more in there than I thought, but I'm not sure I've got to my toothpaste wonder stuff yet. And I still don't know why we're on a beach. Ah, oh, yes, carrageenan. <laughs> What's carrageenan? So that comes from this. This is ah. this seaweed. You basically make that into this powder, which is a gelling agent, actually. Yeah, I was, I was expecting this to be a bit thicker at this stage, actually. Come on, get it in oh, there. Oh, dear, really? I... I forgot that men can't multitask. <laughs> Pouring and stirring? What are you asking me to do? Hmm, but if there's a wonder stuff in toothpaste, it has to be the one thing that's particular to the job of cleaning teeth. And here it is, something called hydrated silica. The key ingredient is an abrasive. I mean, that's actually what all toothpaste share throughout history of time. And this is silica. Silica? Yeah, hydrated silica. It's actually made from the sand we're standing on. Really? Yeah. I'm not sure I like the sound of sanding my teeth down, but this stuff doesn't exactly look like coarse grade. You'll get a real feeling for it in your mouth there, because that's in toothpaste. Oh, yeah, it's very chalky. Mm. Mm. And it's that chalky texture. Yeah. It's a fine grit. Yeah. You've got to get something that's hard but not too hard. Right. It's that gentle but hard thing. So let's bung it in and see how it works with the rest of the ingredients. So this is going to really thicken it up, yeah. hopefully. Come on, give it some welly. I'm feeling it now. Oh, it is turning into something. Thank God for that. <laughs> As well as being an abrasive, the hydrated silica, or posh sand, has given our homemade toothpaste its recognisable consistency. I think that's about it, isn't it? Ta-da! <laughs> we have made toothpaste! Can I taste it? <laughs> Can I stop you for a minute? Because I think it'd be much more exciting if we make stripy toothpaste. Stripy toothpaste? Um, but we can, make, we can make that here? Well, we can try. Apparently, all we have to do is add some food colouring to half the mixture, and if we keep the consistency the same, by a miracle of physics, it should come out of the tube in two stripes that don't mix together. Oh, oh, no. oh no. Malfunction, malfunction. Houston, we have a problem. Right, come on, drum roll. Right, drum roll. Ooh. Oh, oh look is. at that. It is, it is, it is. Genius. So what's our homemade toothpaste like to use? Mm. <laughs> OK, it tastes like a mouthful of chalk dust, but Mark wants me to appreciate how far we've come in toothpaste technology. Try this. This is Victorian toothpaste. It Are looks we... like sludge. These are Victorian toothbrushes. Oh, gosh, cinnamon. Is that your favourite? No. I like cinnamon, but not in this... I like it in a latte <laughs> or in a bun. I just want to make that clear. That isn't left over from Victorians. We made that to a recipe. So this Ooh. is what the Victorians brush their teeth with? Yeah, and the Victorians use this thing called diatomaceous earth. And um, that's really the kind of fossilised remains of little algae that lived millions of years ago. And it falls down to the bottom of the ocean and makes this enormous sediment. And we've been digging up out of the ground ever since. The Victorians spotted that this diatomaceous earth, which also contains silica, by the way, was a useful abrasive. It actually just looks like clay. Hmm. I mean, it doesn't have much of a foaming action. Have no foaming action. That's because the Victorians didn't have sodium laurel sulphate. It has gravel action, <laughs> is what it has. <laughs> So, even though our modern toothpaste, containing hydrated silica, is easier on the tongue, how does its effectiveness compare with the Victorian formulation? I want to pit the two toothpastes against each other to see if there's any difference in how they actually work. And to do that, I'm going to need some pretty special dental devices, just like they have at the Bristol Dental School. Dr Emma MacDonald is going to measure the effectiveness of the diatomaceous earth in the Victorian formulation against the hydrated silica in our homemade modern toothpaste. But first, we need some teeth to test them on. Oh, this is our my Emma, what teeth, teeth you have? <laughs> yes, cow's teeth. Look at the size of this. Yes. Look at that. <laughs> The beauty of using cow's teeth is that we can have a plentiful supply of them. I mean, obviously, it's not the same as human enamel, but it's uh, very, very close. Is this sort of the common size, or have you found the Ken Dodd of the cow world here? <laughs> no, they are actually that size. <laughs> a cow's pearly white is first cut to size using this delightful tooth saw. 
Ouch. Slices are then mounted in this rather unique contraption. And what's the, what's the little red bit there? That's actually covering an area of the, the enamel. Ah, um, so it doesn't so get brushed. So that bit doesn't get brushed, and then it's just the centre little piece that does get brushed. The two different samples of paste are then used to brush the teeth 5,000 times before they're put into another fancy device, which gives us the results. First up, Emma's colleague Sean can reveal how much the Victorian toothpaste ground down the tooth. To me, that looks really dramatic. Oh, yes, but this is quite heavily magnified on this system. The amount of loss that we got from this one was 0.6 of a micron, which is less than one thousandth of a millimetre. Ah, so even though it felt like grit in my mouth, I'm assured the Victorian formulation is effective in toothpaste science terms. Now, you might think that the much smoother modern formulation with hydrated silica would have less effect, but amazingly, the results are very similar. Well, what we're seeing is uh, 0.81 of a micron. So modern hydrated silica gives you abrasive power but without the gritty texture. And what's more, the size of the hydrated silica crystals can be manipulated to make different kinds of toothpaste. You can think of the particles within them a bit like clouds, really. For example, in um, a whitening toothpaste, you'll have the particles that will be really quite dense, sort of like a dense cloud, but then you could have light, fluffy clouds with less tightly um, packed particles, which you might find, for example, in a children's toothpaste. And hydrated silica earns its spurs as a wonder stuff in other ways, too. It's odourless, tasteless and chemically inert and turns up in the production of cosmetics, paints, and even beer. Clever stuff. When I first started this journey, delving into the science hiding in our bathroom cabinets, I had no idea where it was going to take me. But discovering the amazing wonder stuffs at the heart of things as mundane as shampoo and toothpaste has genuinely surprised me. Made from the sand we're standing on. Really? I love the fact that the basic soap recipe hasn't really changed since they were using it to spruce themselves up for a night out in ancient Babylon about 2,000 years ago. But for me, the standout fact has to be that there's this amazing little chemical that can actually change the electrical charge on my hair and make it more manageable. That's brilliant. Next time, I get back to nature on the hunt for some of the wonder stuffs that secretly keep our homes clean. I get far too intimate with a serial dirt killer. Oh, my God. <laughs> that can disappear without a trace. Oh, that's revived me. I track down the natural source of a wonder stuff that's revolutionised wash day. They knew what hard work was, didn't they, in those days? And Mark whisks up a recipe for a homemade grease buster. I knew when you called me here you were taking the piss. <laughs>